is the capital city of Belarus, an independent nation that used to be one of the Soviet republics. It borders with Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, Russia and Ukraine. Belarus is slightly smaller than Kansas and has a population of just over 10 million people, 17% of which live in Minsk. This is the city where I was born and to which I am returning for the first time after nine years. The first mentioning of Minsk in historic documents dates back to 1067. It was almost completely destroyed after World War II. Most of the city was rebuilt in a style often associated with Soviet leader Joseph Stalin. My country experienced heavy casualties under the German occupation. One in three people lost their lives. That is why war, monuments and statues are very much in evidence all over the city, as well as all over the Soviet Union. While certainly not on the economic level of Western European cities, Minsk today seems to be a thriving place with many more cars, restaurants and stores than what I remember from my youth. Of course, I didn't come here to go on a shopping spree, but to see my mom. She raised me in this apartment in the Serebrenka section of the city since 1970. It's a one-bedroom, one-bathroom unit. This is where I lived for 26 years. My husband and I enjoyed countless home-cooked meals here, in this room, as many of my friends and relatives came to see me again over the course of our stay. Not everybody in Minsk lives in a small apartment like my mom's. Take my friend Irina. We met at the University of Culture when I was 19. Her husband, Sasha, is one of the post-Soviet success stories. He organizes large industrial exhibitions all over the country. Together they have built a three-story house in a neighborhood on the outskirts of the city, not all that different from an American suburb. Of course, people like Irina and Sasha are the exception and not the rule in Belarus. Olga is my other close friend from my days at the University of Culture. Like Irina, she also pursued a career in the arts and today is the manager and choreographer of a modern dance group. Both Irina and Olga organized a number of cultural excursions for my husband and me. One of our favorites was a full dress rehearsal by a famous children's group Dudariki. The Dudariki folk group was founded in 1970 and performs a wide range of classic and original folk songs using traditional instruments. 12th century, it's a copy from a 12th century instrument. In 1995, the group's leader, Dmitry Rovinsky, was awarded an honorary United Nations diploma for his special contribution to the preservation and promotion of Belarusian national traditions. His group has been actively involved in charity work throughout Belarus. All the members of the group practice their playing, dancing and singing at school, not far from where I grew up. Dudariki's music is not only popular with the Belarusians. They have been welcomed in many European countries as well as Taiwan.
has expressed a big desire to perform in the United States, but finding the financial support is critical, since the average Belarusian salary barely allows for travel expenses within Europe. This type of music has its origins in the thousands of villages that are spread across Belarus. Throughout my childhood I spent my summers in this village, Dubravy. About 25 miles from Minsk, Dubravy is where my grandmother and mother were each born and where they currently spend half of each year in a house that my family has had since the early 1960s. Bigger than my mom's apartment in the city, our house in the village has three bedrooms and a kitchen. Unfortunately, there is no plumbing whatsoever, so staying in our village is a lot like camping in the woods. Peter is our next door neighbor and tends to the place when my mom is not there. He too was born here. In fact, the only time he ever left was during World War II. After that, he returned and raised a family here, working in a local factory. Peter has a few friends left in the village, but not as many as in years past. Villages all over Belarus are essentially dying. Since there is almost no work in such places, most of the younger generations have left for life in the cities. Those who stayed walk on their own land and live fairly simple lives. A good example of this is my cousin's mother Lilia. She and her husband live on a small farm. Scott and I paid them a visit. Of course, in my country no such encounter is complete without the host providing a big meal, in spite of the fact that we had just eaten lunch that day. Lilia and Konstantin have several animals, including a goat, a pig, a horse and two cats. They live on a combination of her retirement money and his income in addition to small amounts of farm produce. While I'll always be a city girl at heart, I still admire this kind of living and recognize how important a role it has played in the culture of Belarus. For how much longer such communities will continue to exist, only time will show.
just so happened that my return home after so many years coincided with the opening of the Belarusian National Library. Located on the outskirts of Minsk, the building occupies over 1.2 million square feet and stands 236 feet tall. It is estimated to have cost over $200 million. Scott, my mom's friend Valentina and I, were given a tour of the library the day after the official visit by the president of Belarus. The director of the library, Roman Matulski, is one of my good friends. Roman and I used to teach at the Department of Librarianship at the Belarusian University of Culture. In 1993, we both were Rotary Fellows in Holland, where we spent a month working as interns in Wirt Public Library. After I left for America, he was appointed to serve as a dean of the library school, and later he became the director of the National Library. Roman's family had barely seen him at all during the months leading up to the opening. For all the worries and stress that being the caretaker of such a grand project entails, Roman makes less than a thousand dollars per month. Obviously, salaries here have not progressed as much as some of the other signs of development in Belarus. It does bother me that people like Roman, who has such high levels of education and responsibility, aren't rewarded accordingly. Progress is slow here, but it is happening. I am just glad that I will now be able to go and witness the changes more frequently. And of course, my mom will now be able to see me much more often. That's the most rewarding aspect of coming home. Спасибо, сердце, что ты умеешь так.